Welcome to Dad Talk Today. The podcast for dads facing some of the toughest moments of their lives. We are here to walk with men through divorce, keep them connected to their kids, help them understand their rights, and work for change in family law courts. Moms, you are always welcome to. We are all about advocating for shared parenting and doing what is best for our kids. Here is your host, Eric Carroll. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Dad Talk Today. I am not Eric Carroll. I am Melissa Isaac. Eric is actually in Iowa right now. He's up at the State House talking to legislators and really making waves about our issues. So I'm excited about tonight's show because we are talking with Connie Reguli. And Connie is an attorney in Tennessee. And there is no one that I know of who knows more about Title IV and CPS issues than Connie Reguli. So, Connie, it's so good to have you. How are you doing? Oh, yeah, great. It's so good to see you. I love seeing you at CPAC. That was so fun. So, yeah, yeah, I'm great. I'm glad to be here with you. It was so nice to run into you at CPAC. And, you know, we were talking about family court and fatherlessness and issues with CPS. And you were with us quite a bit. And you can tell it was a hot topic at CPAC. And these legislators, I think, are finally, after decades, starting to listen to the fact that this is a hot topic for the people and the voters want to hear this kind of reform. But it was really good to have you at CPAC. I tell you what, yeah. you're yeah, one and of you know, the advocates. And it's interesting, too, because it's the same thing with uh, the CPS issues and the Child Protective Services issues. While I was at CPAC, I made my way around. And, of course, just I, I think, you know, most of what you do there is network and meet other people and, you know, try to get the conversation going on whatever your topics of interest were. And I stopped and I talked to a young woman at Brightside Broadcasting. And I was just, you know, I'm trying to keep trying to get these even alternative network shows to really keep their eyes open for these stories because they're popping up here and there and you know and they kind of show up and then they sort of disappear again and come to find out her her and her siblings had been removed from her parents when she was a child because they were traveling ministers and they were homeschooling and it was I think southern Alabama or southern Georgia and and they got separated from their parents and then I was talking to one of our new congressional candidates in Tennessee and I always opened the topic about foster care and CPS and he had been in foster care as a child so you know it's not something that somebody's typically going to mention on their own but my goal is to get the narrative keep the narrative going and keep raising it and every time I see stories that pop up in the news and mm -hmm. I mean, they're now starting, you start to see them and I've pushed for stories. I've had a local reporter that's covered several stories for me. So, you know, that's one of my job to keep it talking. And, you know, the connection between Title IV-D and Title IV-E and, and um, B that is really destruction of the family. So, and it's really yeah. the, the perverse federal funding and the perverse um, legal fictions, the legal narratives that are so disjointed and so dis detached from what we really need in America and, for, and from what really promotes family and security and just all the things by nature that we should be looking at and keeping. All of those uh, funding, perverse funding schedules just really interfere with that. They do. And you can't go through family court without Title IV in some form or fashion rearing its ugly head and financially incentivizing the breakdown of the family or the keeping of one parent out of the lives of children or incentivizing the removal of children altogether. So we've got Title IV B, D, and E. And we hear most about Title IV D because it's connected with child support. And most people who go through family court, most men are, you know, have heard about Title IV D. But can you break down for us the different titles and, and how they're relevant in the family court system? Okay. Well, first of all, everybody needs to know it's social security money. <laughs> okay. It's our money and it's our money that we're paying in to particularly be taken care of when we are aged or infirmed. I mean, that was the original uh, reason we had social security and there's all these invasions and these entitlements through title four B, D and E are very perverse and they are stealing our money. 
So Title IV-B is a family stability reunification money. This is money, as, it, as you can tell from it's the earliest letter in the alphabet here. That's one of the first funding schemes that developed when they really started taking federal money. And I always tell people when I say federal money or I say state money, it's not federal money or state money. It's your money. Mm -hmm. So always keep that in mind. This is taxpayer dollars, but I'm just talking about kind of where it travels through. So from the Social Security Fund. Yeah. So the Social Security Fund. So the federal money that is coming in is uh, for Title IV B started in about the late 70s, early 80s is when it really started flooding in under the CAPTA, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. And so that is where we first started having this money for family services. And, you know, when CAPTA came up, they didn't want to attach it to poverty because there was a war on poverty at the time, although it is attached to poverty, but they really, that's why they titled it uh, child abuse prevention and treatment. And then along comes, it takes several years before we ever see title four D. And I will tell you, you know, I went to law school late in life and I didn't get my law license until I was in my forties. And, you know, one of the first things I did was get, into domestic law. After I did criminal, I was a prosecutor and then I did family. And it's not long before you're in family law. And it's almost funny now when I think about it, but you see these pleadings come through that have a Roman numeral one and a Roman numeral five on it. And then it has a capital D. I mean, and even attorneys, yeah, when I mean, when they first started doing it, even attorneys didn't know what 4D was. Mm -hmm. I mean, we thought it was like yeah. some, yeah, we thought it was like some special coding system or something. We had no idea it was related to federal funding. So mm -hmm. as you began, as I really started digging in with my frustration with just the entire system, family court, CPS, child support, the entire system, I started digging into the funding. But when you first are introduced to Title 4D, you know, as an attorney, all you see are these lists of rules, right? And this chart. And and I remember when I saw, even before income shares, when we had just flat percentages, like 21%, 32%, I remember looking at that chart and, you know, I'm a well-educated person and I look at that chart and I'm like, who came up with these numbers? Like wh what? Like, and so I look it up and it's like some university like studied average incomes and because it just made no sense to me, it just made no sense. And, you know, and then obviously you have people who have children with different family uh, basis. And so now you're layering the child support on top of each other and it just made it totally ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And then actually one of the biggest neck shockers to me was the fictional income that they put on people for or imputed income. I am like, right. Yeah. I am like, and then you take a stay at home mom, she gets a divorce and she's raised the kids and they're still young. And they're like, well, you got to go out and earn $30,000 a year, but they don't attend for any childcare. So, and it goes both ways. I mean, it can be the dad as well. So it's just totally fictional. I remember when income shares came down and we started looking at it, it's got its own set of perverse problems, but it's just, uh, you know, it has no relationship at all to what it actually costs to raise a child. It has no relationship to that. Nobody ever looks and says, okay, so what do you think you spend for food for your child or transportation? Because every family has different needs, you know? So you may have a family that has, let's say, you know, they're homeschooling, right? And so they may have a different set of needs than somebody who can send their kids to private school or mm -hmm. somebody who has their child in, you know, six different extracurricular activities versus somebody who thinks, you know, the best thing for a child is, is you know, Sunday school and, you know, Bible time, right? So everybody has different needs. And the court really divorced itself from looking at that needs. And what I saw as an attorney is that because they divorce themselves from looking at the needs financially, they really just divorce themselves from looking at the needs of the child at all. Right. Well, I mean, you're, it's, you're absolutely right, because one thing the judges want, right, they want to hang on to this discretion. They say, no, 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 we can't have a presumption of anything, of shared parenting, a presumption of fitness, even though it already exists for the Supreme Court. We can't have all that because it would take away from the discretion of the judges. But that we find the judges the discretion that they want is just to sign off on, on, I hate to say it, but these standardized orders that really right. have little to do with discretion. But in terms of Title IV D, so when you look at, there's there's guidelines, right? So each state is different, but each state, or well, how they calculate can be different, but they have these guidelines. So if you have a, a parent who 
is is a doctor, and then you have a you know someone who works as a I don't know, works retail. Let's say obviously there's a disparity in income, right? So how does the child support system address how much that child needs, and is it based on the needs of a child? Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I had a case one time, it was kind of interesting because the mother was a doctor Mm -hmm. and she had worked really, really hard. The whole family had traveled around to about four different cities so that she could meet her specialization requirements. And dad had been pretty much a stay at home parent. And I represented dad, but honestly, he was um, maybe not the best of the two parents. Right. I mean, just just because of his quirks and some of the weird things that he did. And she had become more, I mean, she had gotten all her specialization. They had settled down and really the court awarded her the primary custody in that case. But here we have a dad in that case who had had been the primary parent, had depended on her income. And, you know, he is a lot of the time is taken away from him because, you know, there things are going to happen when you get a divorce. And then he's paying child support to his doctor wife. Right. So it's just kind of it was just like really crazy to me that that kind of even unfolded that way. Yeah. And it seems so unfair and not about the needs of the children whatsoever. And like in the case that you're talking about, you know, dad might have had his quirks, but he was the primary parent. And all of a sudden he doesn't have his kids. And now he's out money that he didn't make during the marriage. It it just, but if you look back to, you know, a lot of judges think, a lot of people think, a lot of lawyers, litigants who think, well, somebody has to pay child support. Well, where did that come from? Somebody has to pay child support. We know, especially dealing with Title IV-D, the states make money off of people paying child support. So you yeah. can go into detail as to, we've heard it's 66 cents on the dollar, it's it's dollar for dollar, it's up to $5 on the dollar. Can you kind of give us a rundown of Title IV-D and how the reimbursement takes place? Yeah, well, you know, so much of it is private contracted now. And honestly, I haven't like pulled those private contracts, but you know, the private contractors get money to hire the attorneys to run the show. And then we've had all kinds of child support processing programs go on. And I've worked, you know, some child support cases from, I don't know, I think somebody was in Georgia and then I had one in Texas. And just how all of that processing, you know, happens in Tennessee, the clerk was taking 5% off the top for a while. And then somebody said like, no, you couldn't do that. So it's really hard to tell who's skimming off the top. But what you do have is you have somebody holding millions of dollars, even if it's just for a day or two at a time, right? Because now a lot of these child support collection services are giving cards, debit cards, right? So you don't go out and spend your $400 or whatever it is in one day. So there's some institution out there that's holding a lot of money over a 30 day period that is that they're making money off of, right? I mean, it's a financial institution. It, it very much is. It's a business. And you know, people think that child support, it's about the welfare of the children. It's about supporting the children. It's its a business. It's like Walmart. It's a money making business, like an institution, like you're saying. So, you know, every time someone pays child support, it's mostly dads. So let's say every time a dad pays child support, that state, whatever order that dad to pay gets money just for collecting the child support and dispersing Mm -hmm. it out. So, you know, and what I've also thought about, I mean, here we are, it's 2021. I mean, there's apps for everything, right? I mean, it almost seems like, you know, between two parents, if they're co-parenting, there should be an app there where they can create a budget, you know, for the children. And then they can, you know, donate some payments to it or decide what they're going to pay, right? So they can set a budget for, you know, four or $500 a month for the child to spend for food and clothing. And then, you know, they decide what they're going to contribute to that and actually track it. Because I have been very frustrated with the fact that somebody who's receiving child support, they never even have to be accountable for it. And that is like they're a fiduciary, right? They're a fiduciary for the benefit of the child. And, you know, I've seen them go out and buy a new car, right? They go buy a car. They have a car payment that they can depend on every month. And it's really not about the children at all. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we could do to make it better. And I like the card idea because I know here in Alabama and in Florida, there is no tracking of it whatsoever. In fact, right. you know, the law doesn't even afford us the, the opportunity to get in and, and see where the money is spent on right. top of it. It's completely at the discretion of the person who's getting it. So, 
you know, we hear a lot again about Title IV-D because it is connected to child support. But when we're pushing legislation, um, you know, talking about shared parenting or whatnot, of course, we know that if one parent gets custody, the other one's the non-custodial parent, there's a higher amount of child support. With shared time, you have lower child support amounts. What does that do to funding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. So, I mean, that's all something that's unfolding. And, you know, the whole shared parenting and, you know, I am very proud of people like Eric and Mark and, you know, you know, the guys that I've met, Chris Rainbold, I met up in DC, the guys that have really just, and, and cash, it's like, I'm just going to keep pushing it. I'm going to keep speaking to speak, keep getting out there. And I'm so proud that they're doing that because if, you know, the change comes from the voices of the people and it doesn't, it, it, it'll never come if we don't speak up. So I am really proud of them. Absolutely. I think the, yeah. And the issue with the shared parenting, I mean, kind of my issue with it, and I've rolled this around in my head over and over and over and over and over is, you know, the courts on a, let's just take a divorce. The courts are not really in that divorce situation, really sitting down and looking at some type of continuity for the children. You know, what have the children really experienced? Uh, and what are their, what are the key issues that are important for them about safety and security and their needs met? And, you know, who's taken them to the doctor and, and who Who's the one that attends school and who does their homework? And, you know, and, and you can be the parent who's more active in the day to day, but you can also still be the parent who is and, and not the fun parent, because I know a lot of people who are ordered to pay child support and they have such limited time. They're like, I just feel like I'm the fun parent. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, there are parents who provide that um, some emotional comfort for a child just by their presence. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I totally bought, acknowledge that, you know, if dad can't go to every soccer game, or every school meeting, you know, the fact that he can come home and tuck you into bed and say good night and give you a kiss on the cheek and, you know, maybe send through three or four minutes with you every day. That's why I think daily contact is so important. And then it's also important that the courts start identifying, you know, what are the things that we need to do so that these children have continuity of care? And we just haven't done that. And, you know, I've, I've talked to people, I've talked to people in mental health about, doing an assessment and I know it, you know, that can go haywire too, because like in California, they force you to have this parenting assessment. That's like $20,000, which is ridiculous, yeah. right? Yeah. Because it's not a psyche Val. It's like just who, what are we doing in this household? So, you know, we really need to sit in and focus on that. And, you know, I would, I would like the, you know, the dads who are uh, really focusing on this issue to kind of think about that as well. And how do we drill down to that and really find out how we're handling the needs of the kids? No, I think you're exactly right. And you had a question, um, how do we stop this? Because this is definitely a legislative issue and it is destroying lives. You know, you said, I mean, there's people out there that have been literally pounding, you know, their feet, their boots are on the ground. I mean, I, I don't know of anybody um, who's been more active than Eric Carroll has been. I mean, you want to talk about traveling. Up until Eric, you know, we, we've never had as many legislators or any really for that matter much go on record and video and, and, and addressing these issues. So, you know, Connie, what's, what, what's your take on her question? Yeah, so we and I have really worked just as diligently on child welfare reform, right? I mean, that's been my huge issue, but it's the same thing. I mean, I've been to the Hill. I've been to D.C. I've talked to legislators. I've talked to, you know, attorneys. I talk. I build a, a social media group on Facebook, a Family Forward Project to really get people to kind of collect and share stories and stay on top of it. I also belong to the American Bar Association's uh, subgroup for parent representation. We are even just kind of the brainstorming in there and the things that we're sharing, we're getting those things to bubble up. I'm watching more news stories, but you know, the number one thing is to raise a narrative, right? To talk the talk and walk the walk and, and raise the narrative and have people who are, yeah, there are bad actors definitely in the bar association, but you know, it is who are, you know, look for attorneys. I'm the kind of attorney, I'm a great litigator. I can be a, an amazing litigator because it's so tactical and technical and, you know, getting your evidence and collecting your evidence. I am very good at that. But I also come into every case with my clients and I say, you know, I'm not here to buy and sell your child. I'm not yeah. here to sell you a divorce. I'm not here, you know, to sell you on hostility. You know, my first thing is to get, my number one goal is to get you on the other side of this issue 
issue and for you to have some life and normalcy if I can at all achieve that. Right. And yeah. it'll depend on who the attorney is on the other side sometimes, you know, yeah. you know you're exactly right. I know we have a, I have a case right now where a judge ordered 50 50. The kids will not go to mom's house. They will not visit with mom. So after a conversation with my client, I called the other attorney and I said, listen, what are we going to do? Because the, these kids need to have both parents in their life. What are we going to do? We, you know, we put the traditional lawyer hat, took it off and you know, slid it to the side and talked like two normal human beings and saying, what are we going to do to try and mend this relationship or address these issues that are going on? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Ryan he, he makes a good point, you know, bad, bad actors in the bar association, a lot of attorneys just want to win that they can, they can rip children away from good parents and go home and sleep at night. I'm not that yeah. lawyer. And I know you're not that lawyer. No. Well, you know, and I will also say though, the other thing with lawyers and, you know, we're going to talk about this some more in a minute is they're afraid, right? They're yeah. afraid that if they have a client that says, you know, I mean, if the, if the dad in that case is saying, you know, they're not going to go to her, so I'm not going to force them, you know, I'm not going to do this. And that lawyer stands up to the client and says, look, you know, here's what we need to do. Well, then that bad client goes and files some complaint or, you know, or, or uh, I mean, it just, you know, there's so many things that we have to balance along the way, but there are a lot of attorneys who are just flat afraid to advise their clients, which we are advisors and advocates, but they're so afraid to advise their clients on the best action to take and the best result they're going to get. You're, you're absolutely right. And I can't tell you how many times in the courtroom, you know, I've had a judge say, okay, Miss Isaac, I've heard enough. You can, you can take a seat. And I say, <laughs> I, I will certainly do that judge as soon as I'm done making my record. But you know this, Connie, so many attorneys will say yes, judge, and they will sit down to the detriment of their record, to the detriment of an, of an appeal down the road. But you're right. Attorneys are scared. Yes, they are. Yes. And I know before I, after I've got everything I, I want to say, before I sit down, I say, just a minute, judge. And I lean down to my client yep. and I say, is there anything else? Yep. Right. Yep. Right. That's been hard with Zoom trials for sure. Well, that's been a real challenge. But I always go, hold on a minute, judge. And I'm like, you know, reach down there and say, did I miss anything? So, yeah, it definitely. Yeah. The same thing where I've been told uh, I don't need to hear anymore. I had one judge. This is an old case. I was a really bad judge. She finally got kicked off the bench, but it was a divorce. And the other uh, the other side was a plaintiff. And you know how that goes. They're first up in the in the shoot. Right. And mm -hmm. she called my poor client. Right. And put her on the stand and just beat her up for a day over stupid things. Right. Just yeah. stupid, stupid things. And so the next morning they're calling her back on the stand and we get to about 10 30, 11 o'clock talking about breaking for lunch. And the judge goes, I think we're about done here. <laughs> and I leaned up and I go, your honor, just a reminder. I haven't opened my mouth yet. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yep. And so, yeah, so ultimately I went, I won that case after an appeal and thousands of dollars that should have never been spent. And that's the well, other thing. It's like, yeah. like you said, you have to preserve the record and then you have to be prepared to go to the next step. Yep. And here's the frustrating part too, is I think, you know, the, the family court system is adversarial in nature. So it pits parents against one another and makes it so they have to fight each other. Then we, we hear all, all about collaborative law and all this. Okay. Look, the system is set up to be adversarial. So, and yeah, and a lot of our our our, watch, our followers, they know this. You go to court and you spend thousands of dollars fighting over stupid things that don't matter. Well, mom took them to the dentist 60% of the time. Dad only, only took 40% of the time. Dad lets them eat ice cream at 9 o'clock at night. Well, who cares? It's just, I do that. I can come get my kids. You know, yeah. it's night. So over things that completely don't matter. And, and I've had judges pipe up and say, wait a minute now. I do all of this and I think I'm a good parent. So can we move on? And then yeah. I just entertain it. But that's the part of when you when you financially incentivize the win, when you financially mm -hmm. incentivize with with money and power, money and control, then we're then here we are. Yeah. Here, so I will, I'll tell you another thing that I always do with clients in a divorce and, you know, divorces are hard and, uh, you know, people come in, there's always been something that's happened. Right. And I always, after I talk to them and then we start talking about what it looks like, what it's going to look like after it's all over. And I always say this, I go, just remember 
There are no damages for being pissed off in a divorce. Okay. There's no pissed off awards. So let's sit down and we talk about what we need to do to get you through this. But, but yeah, I mean, and it's bad. I know, you know, a lot of dads are involved with, with this program. And I did hear, I think in the introduction, you know, moms are invited to, because a lot of moms, I've had mm -hmm. cases where moms have been uh, just tormented by the courts. I've, I, you know, especially if you have a very narcissistic judge and they, um, I mean, I've seen judges come out and wink at, you know, parties, w wink at a, a, a dad in that case. I knew he'd had some relationship with him in the past. So, yeah, it's just a, it's a terrible system. And we need to start sitting down and assessing, especially if we go into a divorce and if there are children involved and we go, OK, let's look at the continuity of care for the children. Number one, make that the number one thing. And then we'll start argue about what the parents want to fight over that. I think we would have would be huge. And so let me that's a nice segue into me telling you. I have asked for a bill to be introduced this year. It is introduced in Tennessee. I have a Senate sponsor. I have a House sponsor. You know, there's a lot of crazy things going up there. So it's kind of dragging through and I'm not sure if it'll make it, but I'll come back with it again. But what I have asked for is that the court appoint a family advocate in any case. Now, this is not divorce right now. This is for any type of a CPS case but that there be a family advocate whose focus is on family support and family reunification, who is not part of the adversarial proceedings. So um, I've told them, you know, cause anytime you uh, do a bill, they want to know how much it's going to cost. I said, look, this is, we're going to do this as a volunteer program. I've already got a training program set up for them and it's just, and, and I know you work a lot of CPS cases, but this is just to help the parents understand what the process is, to have a support person there with them during the meetings, during the administrative meetings, you know, making sure that they understand what drug testing means, making sure they understand what these programs mean and that they know how to challenge them and what questions to ask. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed and I'm doing some phone calls and I did put a little blog up about it. I posted it in Family Forward. I'm going to repost it. If people will look at that, I have a little script written up. I have all the phone numbers for the legislature listed on it. So all you have to do is pull up my blog, get your phone, read the script. <laughs> so, yeah. and basically just says, you know, the Family Forward Project is uh, promoting child welfare reform. It's a nationwide trend and we want you to support this bill. So yeah. I am looking for people to help support me in that. That sounds good. That sounds great, actually. And I know you do a lot of CPS work. You do more CPS work than I do. I think that's more of your focus, actually. So when we, if we go back to the Title IVs, when you're dealing with CPS, Tell us about the Title IV B and the Title IV E money that go filters through CPS that we normally don't deal with in regular divorce court. Well, yeah, and and actually, since we're going to that, I will tell you that also Title IV D is entangled in the whole CPS structure because once a child is put into foster care, Title IV D requires requires the state to haul those parents into court after they've lost their children and order them to pay child support to the state. It is a requirement. They're supposed to do it within 10 days. I mean, I just can't imagine, you know, let's just double dip the trauma here, right? Let's steal right. your kids and then let's order you to pay for them. So Title IV D is required there. And so the Title IV E is about putting kids in foster care. And you cannot get your hands on the Title IV E money unless you put children in foster care. Now, let me tell you the difference in the funding issues. So Title IV B, which I talked about, which is the family stabilization, family services, runs about $800 million. It's also a fund. This is the, this is the federal money. So there is a certain amount of matching that has to go on, excuse me, from the state, but it is the that's the amount of federal funds. The Title IV B can also be sequestered, attacked, modified, changed. It's not a very secure funding system for the agency. Title IV E, on the other hand, is a dollar for dollar match. It's never subject to sequester and it's a use it or lose it scheme. So that is like nine billion, right? So you have 900 million versus 9 billion. So you've got a 10 times the amount going into Title IV E. And then the states have to basically match that money. So you've got about an $18 billion business going into uh, foster care. Now let's add to that because people don't even think about this other pocket of money. 
if the children are removed, I love to tell the story because people who don't nothing about CPS, they just, their mouths just gape. But let's say there's a poor family. They're working, you know, he's working week to week, doing odd jobs. They're living in a hotel. They've got two or three little, you know, very young children and he loses his job and they get kicked out on the street. Now they're homeless. Now DCS can come and pick up the three children because they're homeless, put them in a foster home, pay the foster parent $4,500 a month tax free, give them free transportation, free medical care, free um, all kinds of other benefits, clothing allowances. I mean, you just name it. It just goes on and on. Then they order those parents to come in and pay child support on the children. And then if they can't pay child support, they terminate their parental rights mm -hmm. for not paying child support on the children. And then the foster parent adopts those three children. The state gets a $35,000 bonus check from the federal government. And the foster parent continues to get entitlement money until those children are 18. Now, this fund, the Adoption Entitlement Month Fund, has started in uh, really, it started a little bit before 1997, but it really kind of took off in 1997. And it has now, so we're 97, 2007, 2017. So we're what, 20, about almost 25 years into it, right? And so this fund, of course, has like exponentially just grown, 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 yeah. grown, right? Now, just in Tennessee, that adoption entitlement money is $9 million a month. $9 million a month. Again, it's all our tax money. It's all our money. And just think about had that family been re-educated, been given some job skills, even given temporary housing for six months, that mm -hmm. it would have saved the taxpayers, would have saved us millions of dollars. And the family would be whole. The family would be whole. So, Connie, what you're saying is it doesn't sound like this has anything to do with the best interests of the children, right? Because you're not saying that the parents were bad parents. You're just saying that the parents fell on hard times, weren't able to keep a roof over the kid's head. So instead of saying, here you go, here's here's six hundred dollars for a deposit somewhere and, and you know another six hundred for first month's rent, twelve hundred dollars, we're going to spend minimum forty five hundred dollars taking your kids and put them in foster care mm -hmm. but what does that possibly have to do with the best interest of children right and i'll tell you another example i had that was so sad and i i mean it was so frustrating to try to work through i had a, a young couple who were both disabled and they had truly had disabilities one had a physical uh birth defect and the other one had uh, a defect in just their you know disabled in learning capacity they were getting these little social security checks right they had learned to live on them. They were living in a little trailer and their air conditioner went out and they had a hole in the floor of the trailer. They had two beautiful young children and the state came and took those children away from them because they could not uh, keep stable housing. They couldn't keep a good housing for them and then are paying the, to foster care these children at, you know, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's outrageous. It is outrageous. And we know of the 678,000 children in foster care that 85% of 85% of them are there under what's termed neglect and it's not physical or sexual abuse. Right. It could be poverty, <clears throat> poverty and but, some but, substance abuse, of course. Well, so the law says that poverty is not a reason to take someone's children, but how often do you see poverty being the reason that it takes someone's children? Well, poverty is huge. I, you know, I work a lot of cases. I reach out and work throughout Tennessee and a lot of rural counties in Tennessee are very poor. They're very poor. And especially with the pandemic, you know, the little jobs that they've had either doing roofing or, you know, uh, basic, you know, landscaping or, you know, road work or whatever, There's they've really been hit hard with the pandemic. And so poverty is huge. And of course, you know, I, I'm a private attorney. Journey and I have to tell people when they call, it's like, look, you know, there's different ways I can work with you. I can work in consulting or I can be your attorney. But, you know, I, I have I'm a private attorney and I do have my own bills to pay. So it's a quite a struggle for them. And, you know, they'll do the best they can, but they will lose their children, you know, because of poverty. It is for sure. So things that I've seen here in Alabama, the law is once a child is in foster care for a period of 12 months, 
that the state has to file to terminate the parental rights. The problem is, is there's ISPs along the way. There's like meetings where you get together mm-hmm. with the parents and the social workers and, you know, try to try to, you know, meet the needs of the family. But when you have a parent who, by the way, in my experience, there's been a lot of moms that get their kids taken. Mm-hmm. We did with CPS, it's more moms than his dad's. But they lay out this plan. Okay, mom, you have to go to these classes twice a week and you have to go do a drug testing twice a month. Mom doesn't have a car. Mom's, and, oh, you have to have a full time job, but you got to be at these classes, you know, twice a week. It yeah. makes it sometimes almost impossible for the parents to comply to be able to get their kids back. That is, it's terrible. And and the services are not that good either. Like I, this mom came in and talked to me. She was required to do an A and D assessment because she was accused of being, uh, you know, using too many, using drugs. And she told me the A and D assessment was an online question and answer, totally artificial intelligence. She never spoke to a person. She never had anybody like take any history from her or find out if she had, you know, need to be assessed for any mental health or have any prescription needs. And that after she takes a quiz online with an artificial intelligence, it pops out a report. And of course those reports always say inpatient drug rehabilitation recommended. It always says that. I have never found a standardized test. I've never found a, a, a report that doesn't have some type of, of treatment. And it's usually very intensive treatment that's uh, required of these parents. And then the same thing with their parenting classes. Like I had one mom, she had a little tiny baby. She was accused of dropping the baby. The baby had rolled off the bed and I was able to keep her job with her during the pendency of this. And she agreed to in-home parenting classes. Well, the, the DCS worker came out, it was in the summertime. She came out in like a crop top and short shorts and then was asking her what chores her child had to do and you know how she disciplined her child. And the child's like seven months old. So, I mean, it's there's there's no rhyme or reason to it. It doesn't, there's no standardization. That is the one thing that the Families First Act is trying to require the states to do is to have some type of standardized care. But the services are pitiful. They're pitiful. They, they are. And then Ryan Hoffman has a, a comment. Is my issues being accused of abuse with no actual evidence. CPS has my parental rights on a cliff edge and I have to wait and hope the judge will see through all this crap. So how often do you see these allegations with no evidence? Well, a lot, a lot. And, you know, the most important thing for him is to, uh, you know, uh, uh, and and I'll say this because you probably went through this as an attorney, too. I remember the first time somebody came into my case and it was a horrible case. I mean, there was like no facts, no evidence. And I went like, ah, don't worry about it. You, we're we're going to go to court. They got that burden approved. We're, nothing's going to happen. And I like totally lost the case, right? Because it's like they twist things around so much. So you cannot go into court and assume you don't have to have a defense, right? You, you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. You, even if you say like, I have absolutely never been late for picking up my child, right? You have to be prepared for that defense because the other side will say, okay, I've got three text messages here at four minutes after the pickup time, right? And you're like, what? So, you know, so don't ever, don't ever think that you do not have to prepare a defense and you need to be proactive in that. So, you know, for Ryan, he needs to sit down and he needs to write out and bullet point everything he wants the court to know. And if he has any supporting evidence from that, I love for my clients to take pictures of their kids to court. I'm like, I want, you know, I've had up to 160 pictures, family pictures that I took to court before and made the judge sit there and look at them. I mean, I've had videos of them playing. I mean, you've got to recreate for that court what your relationship is with that child. It is so important. I cannot stress that enough. Mm -hmm. And I also say this as, you know, I was before I went into private practice, I was a DA, you know, and so I, that was the only time I was ever a state employee. And I said, when you're a state employee, a child or a, a lawsuit or a case is nothing but a file folder. Okay. Mm-hmm. It is nothing but a file folder. So, 
you and it is to a judge too. You have to assume to that judge that that judge, your child is nothing but a file folder and you have to recreate that child. I, you know, I can't wait until the day that we can have holograms. Right. And we'll just like hologram right into the courtroom, you know, the dad playing with the child or something, because I mean, I've done that. I've played videos. I've shown pictures. I've shown audios. You know, I had this one case. I represented this dad and mom kept saying, every time he picks her up, she's crying. She screams. You don't want to go. And so I said, I, I showed him a recorder and I said, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go buy a recorder. You're going to put it in your pocket. Next time you go, as soon as you step your foot out of the car, you're going to turn that recorder on and walk up to the door, take your child, get back in the car, turn the recorder off, send me the recording. And sure enough, that 30 second video, that 30 second audio where the child goes, daddy, 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 won the case, right? Yeah. So you have to recreate the reality because it is nothing but a stack of papers and a file folder. You do. And, you know, what I tell my clients is we want to do everything we can to avoid the he said, she said, because in my experience, men don't do well on a he said, she said. No. Woman says, you know, he, you know, she's crying. He pushed me down and told me he was going to kill me. He says, wait a minute. No, I went to the door and knocked on the door and she told me to F off. Right. You know, record in your pocket. We'll fix all that. So you never want to get in a position where he said, she said, now, Tennessee is a one party state, apparently for recording. Mm -hmm. Yes, Alabama, it is. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Alabama is a one party state. Texas is a two. I mean, uh, uh, Florida rather is a two party state. So, you know, Connie's reiterating something very important to you guys. If you can record, then do it, then record. Because in a he said, she said, I hate litigating. He said, she says, I hate that. Right. And I'm you sure can't, you, well. you can't do it. You just can't do it anymore, especially with the technology that we have. You can't do it. I mean, it, you'll, you'll lose. I mean, you, it's a toss up, right? It's yeah. just like a total yeah. toss up. So, mm -hmm. yep. Without a doubt. So, all right. So parents lose their job, fall on hard times. Kids go to foster care, a bunch of money is getting pumped over for foster care, and they may or may not get their kids back. So in Tennessee, how long are the kids in foster care before they file to terminate the parental rights? Okay, so the the uh, the the national requirement is that if a child has been in foster care for 15 of 22 months, wow. kind of odd. Okay. So they could like send them home and take them back and put them in foster care on like a trial home visit. But it's 15 of 22 months and they have to file for termination. I think that's a totally ridiculous, arbitrary. Yeah. Con, why was this not just legalized child trafficking? Yeah. It, and it's ridiculous. I mean, especially since we know that 40% of the kids are removed because of substance abuse. And even if it's for, even if it's for a job in poverty, of course, I don't think they should be removed under those circumstances. I think there should be services offered and, and some rehabilitation, but let's say it's even substance, substance abuse. I mean, substance abuse is, is a difficult hurdle to, to jump over. And, you know, I tell people all the time, I don't understand substance abuse. I don't, I, I don't understand addiction. And so I always defer to other people who understand that more and, and can look at the underlying issues. But, you know, the truth is, is that addicts, it takes time. And, you know, not only do they have to overcome the urge to drink or smoke or shoot or do whatever, they have to overcome those, those psychological issues that are associated with addiction. And they have to understand, they've got to come to the point where they understand how those addiction issues affected their, their uh, parenting. So it's huge. And I just don't see how they can do it in 15 months. You're exactly right. So dealing with substance abuse, most um, addictions come from some sort of trauma. So, right. our, so you know, I, I and I, I don't want to say this ugly, but, you know, a lot of times the courts will refer parents to counselors. You know, they go into counseling and they're the worst counselors ever. They don't get to the bottom of anything. They're like, don't you do drugs now? Oh, well, wonderful. You have a degree, you know. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, are, are, what's the quality of the services that are even being provided to parents right now to, you know, to get their kids back? Yeah, well, and I, I'll tell you, I have a story for that, too, because I was cross-examining a therapist one time. My client was required to go to this individual therapist, and and they're like, I don't know, they were they would, like, pick a topic, or she would pick a topic, like, I don't know, isolation or discipline. And I ask her on the stand, I'm like, so uh, how do you get your uh, sort of treatment plan for that issue, discipline, or our teenage talking back to your parents? She goes, I Google it. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> 
Yeah. So, yeah, so that gets just back to those services that are just, you know, there, there's no standardization. They're, they're, they're corny. Sometimes they're just like corny where people really just need some more support and some better education about how to handle conflict. I mean, a lot of it's conflict, right? Not just people not knowing how to, people yeah. not knowing how to handle conflict. And so, I mean, they need conflict in intervention and management as much as they need anything else. You know, I've had clients come in, you know, who said, hey, I got this other attorney. They're telling me I need to just go ahead and settle or I need to have you know, my rights are going to be terminated because, you know, DHR has said that they're going to bring a counselor in to say that I'm unfit. So, mm -hmm. OK, so that alone, the, the attorney said, well, I mean, if they got a counselor coming. I mean, they right. have a mental health professional coming. So the mental health professionals, I kind of start to salivate. I just mm -hmm. eat them. I just chew them up and spit them out on the fan. So what sh what would you tell our, our followers right now about mental health professionals? Like, do they be afraid of them? Like, how do you confront a mental health professional who would really testify against you? Well, well, I'd like to hear your tactics as well. But I will say there's a few things. So one of them is... I, um, if they do an assessment and then they do therapy following up the assessment, I immediately can beat them up right there because the ethical guidelines for the American Psychological Association says that you cannot do that. You cannot be an assessing uh, therapist and then do the therapy. So that's like a real hammer. I mean, you can go, you can just go right down and nail them on that. And then, you know, just some of the other issues is you just, you know, sometimes you just have to keep a therapist is talking and and you know some of them get very slick I've got a couple in Tennessee I've got a couple what I call court horse psychologists that can yep. you know sit and talk around any issue but sometimes it's a matter of keeping them talking and keeping them questioning just like a narcissist sometimes your best thing is to keep them talking on the other hand sometimes I just like to shoo them off the stand so you know and you have to ask questions about you know well how did you derive at that? What's your factual basis for that? So you're relying upon hearsay. You're relying upon somebody else's opinion of that person. And, you know, and a lot of times they will even give opinions and have very limited interaction with somebody. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's really, uh, and then I, of course I love it when there's two therapists involved in a case because they're never going to agree. Right. It's like having, it's like having two lawyers on the stand talking about a case, right? They're both are going to like have different opinions. So yeah, it's absolutely. great to have two different therapists. But, um, you know, it is a challenge. The other thing, of course, we have challenges very similar is medical opinions. And I do a lot of cases in which there is some type of allegation of medical neglect or medical kidnapping or, or you know, the, the unexplained subdural hematomas, the unexplained fractured ribs, you know, a child who uh, has an accident. Uh, I actually have one right now that's really serious about a child where there's an alleged rape and there really is not good medical evidence on that. And, you know, they're continuing to try to push that. So, you know, when you get a doctor, you've got to be really prepared. And I have a case right. that I did a couple of years ago on the fractured rib syndrome, which is a matter of having really bad bone metabolism, especially a premature infants. And they had like 29 fractured ribs. And oh my gosh, I probably studied for 30 hours just on that topic alone. Mm -hmm. I had a whole binder this thick full of articles and publications on it. I had two different um, uh, specialists, a radiologist and a pediatrician. I spent hours talking to them on the phone. I recorded my conversation with them on the phone. I went back and I listened to it. I made notes. I had to learn the language. I had to learn the jargon. I had to learn, you know, how do you even measure that? How do you account for it? I went and I printed all of, I took every x-ray. I printed it in a binder so that I could show the x-ray taken on this day versus the x-ray taken on that day. When I got him to the court, I put, I had 12 hours of medical testimony. And, you know, and I won that issue, but I mean, it's huge. And it's so yeah. most attorneys do not have the time nor the inclination to become that educated on that subject. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, you're absolutely right. And we have a big question here from Blaine Kunkel. How do you tell where Title IV funds the states receives are spent? There's a Louisiana Supreme Court case, uh, Castell versus Cantrell, that says that the courts that self-fund with fines or fees are unconstitutional as they violate due process. Mm -hmm. It seems that the holding of the case would apply to the incentives the states have to create single family households as the states receive grants based directly upon the number of single family homes in the state. And it cuts off there. So, But that, that's mm -hmm. a good question. How do you tell where the funds are spent? 
Yeah, that's a good case. And I don't know the particular case she's talking about, but I know I've read similar things about when a court is, uh, there's actually an old, there's a Supreme Court case. It's called, I think, Ray Murchison, where like the judge had the ability to assess fines and then he was using that fine. So those fines to pay for his staff, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it is a huge issue. I say, I argue all the time, the internal conflicts of interest of the agency and the contractors is intolerable because you have now, it's, it's you know, 80% privatized. And so you have contractors that are providing foster care services and then doing the quote unquote reunification, which includes supervised visitation programs, et cetera. And it's the same contractor. And I sit in meetings and I go, look, you cannot have your hands in both pockets at the same time. You've got to pick a side that you're going to be on. And so I have really broken the ice on that. And I've made them have conversations about that, that are, are very difficult, but it's actually in a way, I will tell you, ultimately it kind of helped me because it kind of forced those reunification people on that contractor to step it up and do what they needed to do. So I quit bitching about it primarily, but you know, it is true. We have, we have funding that occurs. I mean, just like with title four D there is funding that occurs you know, and I have not broken down all their funding, but my understanding is that their part of their funding has to do with um, the uh, the actual uh, dollar amount they assess. So it's so the more child support they assess, they get more incentivized payments, and and the amount of uh, collections they make, they get incentivized payments, and I believe the amount of arrearage judgments that they are able to obtain. So, you know, the incentives there are clearly directed to dollars, right? It's not just about are we, do we have another happy family. It's clearly about dollars. And I have also complained about in the court system because the court system also gets some monies that come out of HHS for the court improvement project. So they get money for stats it's statistics, right? So it gets back to my argument about your child is just a file, right? Your child is also a statistic. I've got a case right now that they refuse they refuse to send the child home. We've been, all of our courts have been delayed. It's taken us a year to get this court, to, this case to court. We don't have a trial yet for months. Mom has done everything. There is no risk of harm. And they refuse to allow mom to have her child back because they don't have an adjudication. That is a file and a statistic. Okay. That is all that is about. So they want their statistics in order and they want a ticker that says we have so many adjudications, we have so many removals. So many re reunifications, but they have to have adjudications. Yep. And so Blaine, to get back to your question too, I, you might be able to do a FOIA request um, mm -hmm. and that you could probably break down where the money is going or at least how much money the state's getting. Um, but, you know, Kanye, I, I, I'm glad that you're bringing this stuff up because I know every once in a while here in Alabama, the, the, the press will do a news release saying, you know, that, you know, the state of Alabama did, you know, 15 percent more adoptions in 2020 than they did in 2019. And people are commenting, praise God. And, and I'm down there like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just like the buzzkill saying, you know, yeah. <laughs> trafficking right here like people really knew what this was because it's a lot of parents losing their kids mm -hmm. simply because they don't comply with the treatment plan they may not be able to but not they're not necessarily unfit parents but right. here, i don't know about tennessee but you know here we have cases of juvenile court or dependency cases and they're confidential so do you have that same hurdle in Tennessee where a lot of people don't know about it? You can't go to the press or you, you know, you can't even talk about it on social media. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, because I'll say our proceedings are confidential. I have had parents talk to the press. Of course, when I have clients come in now, most of the people that come to me are people who know what I do and they know how vocal I am. And I will always have that conversation with them. I'll say, look, you know, I'm a very active person in child welfare. You know, I like to talk about the situations of the cases. I'm not going to be revealing your name until your case is over and you want to go public because it's too much of a risk to get your child. So 
However, I will say there are a few cases like they totally want to blow it out and go public from day one. And I kind of measure that out, but I don't, I think, yeah, let's just do it because the case is so absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. So there is that confidentiality of proceedings, but it doesn't mean that it has to be secret. And, and a good example, another good example of that is we have what we call child and family team meetings. And they used to make us sign this paper that says it's confidential. And I used to say to them, wait, it's not confidential because you, if you don't like something we say, or you don't like something my client says, you're going to put it in a report and you're going to carry it to the judge and you're going to start talking about it. And they go, oh, well, yeah, well, that's different. That's different. And I go, okay, so it's not confidential. So now they do not say anymore it's confidential. They say it's private, but it's not confidential. I think that's an interesting twist that they've taken on it. But, you yeah. know, they are, um, you know, it's so important to have stories told. And so with the Family Forward Project group that we have on Facebook, I encourage people to tell their stories, to write their stories out, because some of these situations are so bizarre that people do not even believe it. They do not believe it. And sometimes, you know, I always hear something new. There's always something new going on. I swear they have a conference call on Friday afternoon at four o'clock <laughs> where the, all the social workers in the United States get in a call and they're going like, guess what? We tried this week. It worked. Right. Right. <laughs> because it's that crazy. Yeah. Now, the latest one I have, let's see. I brought it in here, actually, because I wanted to show it to you. I'm going to show you this. I I did a live. I showed this to some people the other night. So you have this. This mom came in to me, right? And she went to the hospital to have a baby. And you have this, right? Doesn't look good, does it? THC positive, okay, right? Okay. Right? Does not look good. Okay, well, let me show you what it says down here. See this, all this yellow highlighted down here? Here's what it says. Okay. Unconfirmed results are used for medical purposes only. Unconfirmed screening results must not be used for non-medical purposes, such as employment testing and legal testing. All positive results are unconfirmed unless ordered to be sent to reference laboratory for confirmation. So they use that to go to court and take her baby away from her at the hospital two days old. They use this. Okay, so, so the hospital obviously called CPS then, is that correct? Is that well, that? we're not sure. Probably, yeah, probably the hospital. But then I was doing my own research and, and there's a and this is important too, so I'm just gonna touch on this. We don't have time to get into it really deep. But with methamphetamine and amphetamine testing, there is a difference in the isomers between a D and an L isomer. Mm -hmm. And if they do not specifically test for those different isomers, that they could be the, um, and this sentence right here says, and this is by, by the way, the U.S. Army Forensic Toxicology Drug Testing Laboratory. Okay, so they've got some credibility and it's in 2000. Okay, so this is not new information. It's 20 year old information where it says that if you're testing for meth or you're testing for amphetamines, you have to test for the amphetamines because Meth results from individuals using non-prescription VIX inhalers contain only L-meth. So if they do not test for those two isomers, they cannot say that somebody is illegally using a substance, which is basically the same thing that you've got here that what they did over here, mm -hmm. you know, so it can also be Sudafed. I mean, even some energy drinks test positive for meth. Yep. So, you know, this is, um, this is just crazy that they're doing it. I did do an open records request today for their, their, uh, their uh, training and the procedures for using unconfirmed lab results to remove children ex parte. Let's see if they answer that. Oh yeah. Yeah. We got a question here from Brad. He said, so what's the solution to this discussion? The horror in this is outrageous and disgraceful. Families and children are suffering tremendously. And we all hear, all we hear are more horror stories. We need media attention. Why is this not in the media every day? Well, so I will tell you, if you look hard enough, there is a story in the media almost every day, not every day, but pro at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. I know there just came out a story last week on Florida, a big investigation that they did 
on uh, Florida foster homes and children being abused in the foster homes. Uh, so there's a, uh, with my ABA group, the American Bar Association group, I know one of the stories that they were doing was, uh, you know, suspending t t uh, terminations during COVID. I had a client who participated in an interview with the Marshall Project for them cutting off children for in-person visits and making them do Zoom calls when they're three and four years old with their parents. Oh, so there are stories that are coming out there and a lot of them, I mean, the one from the Florida investigation was actually USA Today. So it was a pretty big story. Um, I have done, um, I have worked my local media and it's a lot of work. Okay. It is a lot of work because mm -hmm. the local media person that I have worked with or the ones that I've worked with, they are, they're always, they know me. I, they know me for a long time. They're like, please make sure that you're bringing me good cases. Right. I mean, we don't want to bring somebody on who's whining and crying and then find out they're really an abuser. Right. And so I do a lot of screening. I really look at their case. I dig into their case. I find out what's going on. I had four or five stories put up by um, uh, channel Fox, local Fox news. <clears throat> they're also they need to start reaching out to uh, the local commissions because a lot of the judges are county judges and they need to be taking their stories to the commissions. I had families in that in uh, Williamson County do that and speak out about a juvenile court judge here and she was just being rude. She was just treating people very, very poorly. And and it wasn't even I think only one of them was a foster care case. But it's just the way that pe the cases were being handled in the courtroom. You've got to support people like you and me and Eric. And because so that we can keep that narrative, it's a matter of connections. You know, God brings me connections every single day of people to talk to, to raise the narrative with, to talk about the changes that need to occur. And I just ask for that direction every day. I'm like, God, I don't know the whole path. Just give me one step at a time yeah. and I'll take it. And that's what everybody needs to do. So you need to document, you need to support, you need to educate yourselves and you need to start talking because I'm telling you in this world, in this country, within three degrees of separation, you know, somebody who's been touched by this. And so that. it could be the person going through the grocery line. It could be your hairdresser's cousin. You know, it could be uh, your, your nurse's. Uh, nephew's child, right? I mean, if you bring up the topic of, you know, the child welfare reform and foster care is just really getting out of hand, there will be, you will have a conversation, you know, with, with one out of every three people. And so I need that kind of support then so I can get laws changed and I can make things happen. We also ultimately need to get the adoption bonus money banned so that we can take off some of that incentive. That's something that we've worked with in DC. It's kind of hard to get anything done in DC, right? now because it's kind of a crazy land but uh that's something that ultimately i think that we're going to continue to push for and i'm glad that over the years there has been more awareness raised as to the you know family court system being a more of a corporation you know we call it family law there's nothing family friendly about family law we are whatsoever the attorneys certainly aren't trained um if, if anything and I've, I've said this before, and I'm just speaking in generalities, but it seems like the, the, the flunkies who don't know how to do anything else end up in family law. That's what it seems like. You, know, you have, you know, the, you have you know, some medical law attorneys, they're wonderful litigators, and then you have conversations with them about family law, and they all say the same thing. Oh, yeah, that's, that's not for me. Yeah. <laughs> Bless your heart. You know, I get that a lot. But well, and I would say, sadly, a lot of family law attorneys are kind of lazy. You know, they just don't just like I was talking about, about educating your client on, you know, preparing to tell the court your story. Right. I always say you own the facts of your case. I'm just a lawyer. I don't know anything about your facts. You need to start writing down your facts, providing me information about what you have, because I'm just a lawyer. Right. But you own your own facts to the case. But a lot of lawyers won't even go that far. And, you know, I'm just I'm really saddened. You know, I tell uh, I was doing a show with somebody else and we were just talking about, you know, the way you handle your cases. And, you know, and I deal with people from all echelons of life, every color person, yeah. every social economic category. And I says, I just look at everybody as equally human. So, you know, we all have different circumstances, different experiences. We may handle things the right way or the wrong way, but, you know, we are equally human and we deserve an equal shot in the courtroom. Right. But right. you've got to be prepared. And, you know, and I, I'm, of, of probably, I mean, I prepare a lot, you know, I've had, I know one judge, I, I had a, this was primarily an alimony case, but 
I did, I stood up and I did my whole closing argument and I didn't even look at a piece of paper. And he was like, Ms. Regulie, you did your whole closing argument and you didn't even take it. You didn't even look at your notes. I'm like, I don't need any notes. I know my case. Right. Exactly. So, um, you know, and, and that's real critical. So it's, it is a very important part of our life though, unfortunately, family law and divorce law. I mean, we know that half the marriages end in divorce. We know that, I, I don't know, I think it's like 30% of the children are now born out of wedlock. So that means there's a lot of paternity actions that need to take place. And we don't have a very good, uh, sufficient system to do it. So, um, you know, I, I say, of course, as, as far as divorces go, I say, you know how you have to take a test before you get a driver's license, right? I mean, you should like have to take a test before you get your marriage license, number one. I almost post on Facebook that judges need to take a common sense test before they yeah. take the bench, but then, you know, got to be. But, yeah. no, you're absolutely right. And the problem, I think a lot of it is, is the attorneys is, you know, any honest attorney in family law can tell you, yeah, it's bias. Yeah. It's really not based on much of evidence. You can go in there. I mean, perjury seems to be accepted. I had an attorney that lied about discovery. I had her dead to rights on the record. I was making my record and the judge tells me, and he's like, I, I, I've heard enough. And I said, okay, I'm going to finish making my record because I'm not going to be called a liar. I'm going to show my emails to refute what she's saying. Mm -hmm. He told me, I was like, I told you I don't want to hear it. He said, if you keep on, I'm going to put you in jail. And I said, okay, we'll do what you need to do. I'm going to make my record. So, but perjury is almost accepted. But if the attorneys would actually just have a show a little bit of integrity and remember that they're supposed to be a zealous advocate of the client. And I have mm -hmm. a lot of people say, well, no, your first duty is to the bar association. No, my duty is to my client. That's where my right. duty lies. <clears throat> but, you know, if there are more attorneys like us, like-minded, who practice law more, more of a fearless manner, things would change. Yes. But in Based upon what you see, the attorneys you're surrounded with, what's the percentage of attorneys who actually go in there and really hold the flag for what's right? Wow. Wow. That is so hard to say because, you know, when I show up on a case, like they know they're going to have to work. Right. So, right. <laughs> so, so I don't see, you know, outside of, and, you know, especially now with COVID, I, we used to, and I have another attorney who works with me here in the office and we were talking about the, you know, the one thing that we miss pre pandemic is although going to court, sometimes a big waste of time, at least on motion dockets, sometimes you got to see a lot of the attorneys and you got to watch their motions and learn their skills, right. And learn oh, their right. weaknesses right. and phobos. I mean, there was, the whole that was kind of your whole ongoing CLE yeah. and we just aren't doing that right now so you know I just know that you know when I show up on a case people I'm like I'm going to ask for discovery I'm going to be detailed about it I'm going to be prepared I'm going to do a pre-trial brief I'm going to have to do my legal research before we get to the courtroom I'm going to sometimes I've even written the judge a proposed order right yeah, I mean I like, Yep. So, so, you know, that is, uh, you know, that's kind of, and the, you know, a lot of the people then if they're on the other side, I mean, I kind of know when somebody comes in and tells me who's on the other side, how the yeah, case yeah. is going to go, but yeah. you know, it's, yeah, it's just really, it's really kind of hard to attach a percentage to that. But, you know, I would just say generally, and it's so hard, for, you know, the other thing about that for a, a litigant that's coming in, it's kind of hard for them to know at the beginning what kind of attorney they've got, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's uh, that's kind of a sad part because I do get a lot of people who come to me after their case has been totally screwed up and, you know, we have to sort it out and, and get it in the right condition before we can take it to trial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and we're, we're over the hour mark now, Connie. I don't want to keep you too long, but... So can you kind of give us a summary, just sum up real quick, Title IV, the, the reimbursements, how it's a corporation, and what can we do to fix it? Okay, so before we do that, I really would like to share with people something very important that's happened oh, in Tennessee. Absolutely. Okay, go ahead. Because this is... Um, I have worked for judicial accountability for a long time. I've been very, I've been very um, retaliated against on this. I am currently facing another set of retaliation. I do, I am asking for people to uh, do a little statement in support. I do have a job form and I'll share that with you and you can share that with the group or they can just kind of write about why they're interested in this. So Patrick um, asked earlier what uh, news on Connie's gag case. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So 
and there's several kind of things going on. I mean, I'm still under indictment. And so that trial, we, we do have a drafted motion to dismiss. The attorney, they, my co-defendant is my client, right? And so she has the public defender and I helped him on a motion to dismiss. It has not been filed yet, but they screwed up the indictment pretty bad. So the judge will have to really go way out on a limb to not dismiss it. Uh, but I am facing a retaliation on, and basically I've called out five different judges on the way on their ex parte orders, their secret, you know, their immoral conduct, their, their secret meetings, their uh, people who complain against them. I've called them out. I called a one, I'm not in the courtroom, but I called uh, on a, a live stream, one judicial, one juvenile court system, donkey justice. And they think that I should be punished for that, even though I have first amendment free speech rights. And I didn't say a factual lie. I basically gave my opinion. And after all, I say the United States Supreme Court is the one who coined the phrase kangaroo court. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is the United States Supreme yep. Court case yep. in Ray Galt, if you're familiar with that. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I am, uh, so I am asking for people, anybody who has known me or seen me or watched me, I am asking that you do that form for me and support me. Okay. So that, with that in mind, I'm going to go to something really important that happened in Tennessee on judicial accountability. So this case came out. <clears throat> this is like amazing. This is so amazing. And I will, I'm going to show people what it is. They can actually Google it and look it up. But if you've had problems with judges and you've been treated poorly in the courts, you need to know about these things that I'm going to talk to you about. So this is the case. Let me see if I can get it up there right way. Can you read it? Can you read the name of it? Uh, Chase V. Stewart. Yep. Chase V. Stewart. Okay. It is the Tennessee Court of, Appeal, Court of Appeals from, uh, actually it came out January the 7th, 2020. Uh, it was filed February the 4th. So um, this is about a case where a judge hated an attorney. He just hated him. And they got crosswise. And the judge got so angry, so angry. He could not keep his mouth shut. And so I did not know, really know that much of this was going on until of July of 2018. A, a man came to me. Uh, Dr. Sam Clemens, and he said he was involved with this judge and he was having a lot of trouble with the judge. And he had heard that I was willing to stand up and try to do the right thing. And I said, OK, I, I am. And so he brought me into this case and he started telling me about this other attorney. There were some news articles coming out on this judge. It was really just kind of crazy, some crazy stuff going on. And so I am, this is August the 30th, 2018. I'm with Dr. Clemens. We're in the courtroom on a breach of contract case. I mean, it's just like totally unrelated to anything that had to do with this attorney. I always have a, I always have a uh, recorder with me, always, always. For over 10 years, I've had a recorder with me. So I have a recorder laying on the table. I don't hide it. I just lay it there. And so at the end of this kind of non-consequential hearing on some scheduling, something, something, there's attorneys in all over the room. And the judge breaks into this diatribe about how horrible this other attorney is who's not in the room, right? They, how, What a horrible person Brian Manukian is and how my client, who's sitting on the table beside me, how my client has colluded with Brian Manukian to impugn him and put stories about him in the newspaper, which are false. And he goes on about how they're totally false and none of it's true. And I hired an attorney and I'm kind of sitting there. I mean, if you can just imagine this for a minute, I'm just sitting there going like, what the heck is going on? Right. What is this? And so I walked out of the courtroom with my client and I said, Sam, I, and I didn't know who this attorney was. I said, Sam, look, if a judge were talking about me like that in a courtroom and there were attorneys in there, I would consider it a professional courtesy for the attorney to call me and tell me. I just would, I think I would want to know. And I'm going to call that attorney and I'm going to let him know. And I had recorded it. And I get, and I'm going to give him the recording because he needs to know what's happening. This is totally inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that this same judge at a CLE, at a continuing law education, had also done the same thing. He had embarked upon this, this diatribe impugning this attorney. And he even said in this room full of attorneys, if your client is reporting false information about a judge to the news, you need to turn him in. 
I'm like, turn them in to who, right? What, what? You're going to turn your client in to what? For false information about a judge? I mean, like, what crime is that, right? I mean, <laughs> people have their opinions on things. So I let this attorney know that the same judge, Judge Binkley, had been talking about him in a CLE. And so he got, he subpoenaed that that uh, CLE because it was videotaped. And sure enough, and there he is. He's just oh, standing wow. up there as bold as ever uh, talking about it. And let me tell you some of the things. So they, so ultimately, so that attorney, this judge, Judge Binkley, had sanctioned this attorney with contempt of court and had fined him attorney's fees of $750,000. Oh my goodness. $750,000. And then he got the Board of Professional Responsibility to summarily, without a hearing, rip him of his license. And this is a very successful attorney summarily rip him of his license, even to, and I'm just going to tell you what it said. It said, this attorney was not allowed to use any indicia of a lawyer, legal assistant, or law clerk, nor maintain a presence where the practice of law is conducted. Wow. He could not even walk in his own office. He could not answer a phone call. He could, he had to go. He was exiled. He was totally exiled from his life with a summary re revocation of his license. And Wait, so this, so tell me again, what did he supposedly do? So, so, so what the underlying allegation was, and it, it gets so complicated. I mean, it's like a whole lifetime movie. He was representing, he was involved in a case where in the in a neighboring county, this this man had been accused of domestic violence and he hired this big name attorney in town in domestic violence. You're supposed to have a 12 hour hold. He hired this big wig attorney who called the judge at home and got the judge to waive the 12 hour hold. So he gets out of jail, goes over and beats his girlfriend up again. OK, that's kind of how it started. And so that gets in the news. And then that judge comes to find out has all kinds of problems with having sex with women, promising to get them off of probation, just all this craziness. And so that th that ends up in another big lawsuit down in Williamson County where the same parties are involved. And so Brian Manukian was involved in that case and there had been some depositions taken. And then there was a question about whether the depositions were under a protective order or whether they weren't under protective order or, and, and so somehow it, that became this big issue of contempt, but, and it's really, by the time it became such chaos, you don't even know what the underlying issues are. Right. I mean, like the underlying issue has no merit anymore. It just doesn't even mean anything. And this Chase v. Stewart has nothing to do with the party's Chase v. Stewart. It's all about the attorney. But here's what the judge said. So the judge said, I'm just going to read this part. Just be patient for with me for a moment. So he said, uh, okay, so th there's this lawyer who I have released a 122-page memorandum and order on who, among many other things, submitted a false and fake package along with another person to the Board of Responsibility in the Court of the Judiciary. Well, come to find out it was fake and it was wrong. Channel 4 picked it up and made it a headline. Totally false, totally false. The Board of Prof Professional Responsibility saw what was on it and said, we're not going to investigate it, Judge Binkley. And I said, oh, please do. I'm begging you to investigate because I know how people are. They'll read half the story and say, oh, it was a put up. They're helping Judge Binkley out. I don't want that. I hired a lawyer and I said, do, let's do the right thing. Full investigation dismissed. It should have been. Now on Channel 4's news, publish it as if it were true. Now, what do I do when I'm sitting there watching that with my family's watching it and all of my friends are watching it? As a judge, it's probably good I don't say a word. Very difficult. But my day will come. And it's just about here. And I feel like it's necessary for me to be crystal clear, transparent and clear. I do not like what this attorney did at all. My day will come. Hang on. It's not all. And then it said, after all, the trial court made these comments. Wait a minute. After the court made these comments, the attorney on behalf of himself and his law firm moved to recuse the judge. And then, the, and of course, the judge re 
uh, denied it. So this judge is saying things like my day's going to come. And of course he did give him an unfavorable ruling and ruled a $750,000 judgment against him. So based upon my recording, my recording of the hearing and the CLE, that attorney took those and asked for a retroactive recusal of the judge. That's what this case is all about. Retroactive recusal. Wow. That's and it's huge. Okay. So back here, it says retroactive recusal is generally not the appropriate remedy. But in Lilburg, the Health Services Acquisition Court, the United States Supreme Court set forth a test to determine whether retroactive recusal is appropriate under the federal recusal statute. And we find it appropriate to apply the Lilburg test here. The courts may look at federal interpretation, et cetera. And then it says, the Lilburg test considers the risk of injustice to the parties in the particular case, the risk that the denial of relief will produce injustice in other cases, and the risk of undermining the public's confidence in the judicial process. The Court of Appeals retroactively recuse the judge, recuse Judge Binkley from everything he did against Brian Mnookin, set aside the all the orders, set aside the contempt order, set aside the judgment of $750,000 against him, and just reversed everything that judge did retroactively. Wow, that's something. That's good. You know, you know, one thing that I find, Connie, is some of these judges get so, um, they're almost like they're untouchable. And I mean, I had a judge say on the record, he said, I don't care what the Court of Appeals tells me to do. I know. This is my courtroom. So, you know, and it's frustrating, especially, of course, we're dealing with families. You're dealing with parental rights. These are fundamental constitutional rights. And it just seems like they did, some of the judges are just so flippant with the way they handle everything. They're very but, flippant. Yes, they no, that's, are. That's, that's very interesting. So. So yeah. So, and uh, yeah. And so along with that, I, I, it's kind of long to get into here since we've spent so much time, but somebody also sent me today a case out of Georgia. And this is a case from September the 27th, 2017, but it's where the court of appeals in Georgia reversed everything that the trial court did, the juvenile court did against them because they, they found that the juvenile court judge had denied their rights, had denied them right to counsel and um, had, you know, denied them due process and not given them good notice. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time and I'll probably do a little live talking uh, just on that case. But yeah, I want to thank you again and thank Eric for just all that you guys do. The narrative is so important. Keep talking yeah. about it. Keep talking about it. I heard Eric say on his live that he's now going to be able to have some opportunities to work with Epic Times. You know, yeah. uh, we have... Um, See, who is it? The other publication. Oh, gosh, I cannot think of it. Uh, the um, uh, social change, whatever, the Chronicle for Social Change. Are you familiar with that? So that. they, yeah, they have done several stories on child welfare and just keeping those stories up. I mean, I'm hoping I've got a couple people who want to work with me on a documentary and just really go out and talk to some of these families and how they've been affected and get their real faces on the air. And you know, I will uh, sh share with you a couple links to some, a couple of the stories that I was able to get out and maybe you guys could just pass them along too. So, okay. you know, learning about Title IV, uh, how the federal government is using our tax dollars to really disrupt families and provide all of these false incentives and just cause more and more destruction is something we need to keep talking about. And, you know, that's the way change comes really is just raising the narrative. Absolutely. And, you know, the last 10 years, there have been so many documentaries that have been made. There's a lot of groups out there, you know, a lot of people talking to, to legislators. And for the first time, they, it, it really does seem to get their attention. So but we can't let up. A lot of people say, well, how can we fix this? What can we do? This is going to be a grassroots movement because mm -hmm. we're, we're fighting a multi-billion dollar industry. We're fighting this huge corporation that is the family court system. So you have to stay on your, your lawmakers. You have to keep your voices raised. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure and support people who, who actually are out there with their boots on the ground. You know, Connie, you've been doing this far longer than I've been doing it. You've been a very vocal advocate. People need to, to support you. Where can they find the Family Forward Project on Facebook? 
Okay, so the Family Forward Project has both a group and a page because they operate a little bit differently on Facebook. So we do have a group with about 15,000 members. And we are, again, we share uh, new stories that are coming up there. We share legislative ideas, uh, different. Some people do their own lives on there. People tell their stories. I really encourage people to tell their story so other people can read it. And I do my live broadcast primarily from Family, Family Forward Project on Facebook. I then upload all of those to YouTube so they can just find me on YouTube kind of regularly if they want to watch some of my prior videos. I do have the Family Forward page. We do have a Family Forward Foundation. That is a page. That is a 501c3 Family Forward foundation.com does have a website we're not we really are using social media more than we're using the website right now uh, but we have those things available through facebook so it's important that we keep collecting that we keep joining together and you know that uh and then it's so great that once we really get to meet face to face like you and i got to meet in february i just so enjoy that it's so fun yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And and again, I, I was so glad to see you there. And I wasn't shocked to see you there because you are that person that does put boots on the ground for change. And you guys, I can, I can promise you this. There's not a lot of attorneys who get out there and stick their neck out because it is not, um, it's not, I will say this is not fun. There's a lot of days I don't like this job whatsoever, um, but the passion keeps you going. And Connie is definitely one of those people. She's one of the trailblazers that other people like me can, can walk the path that she's already knocked down. So certainly appreciate that. But thank you so much, Connie, for coming on. And we're, we'll keep up with you. Um, I know you talked about needing uh, statements for, for your, your case, the retaliation case, you guys go to the Family Forward Project, follow Connie, and um, we'll bring you back on again. But thanks again so much, Connie, for coming on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And good night. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are fighting for the rights of parents worldwide. If you want to help support our podcast and for us to continue this mission, please join us at patreon.com slash dad talk today. You will find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Clout Hub, Parlor, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, the podcast app, Google, Apple Podcasts. We're a little bit of everywhere. And guys, every time you like and subscribe, you help us continue this mission. Thank you, and we will see you next time.